According to the World Health Organization, 2 million young women live with untreated obstetric fistula in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Experts say that about 90% of fistula cases are treatable. I wanted to find out why someone would suffer so much for years from a condition that can be corrected in a day. My quest takes me to the Kenyatta National Hospital. I'm here to speak to a man who has been performing fistula surgeries for more than a decade, one among the few in the country. I go in with an M uh, to close that fistula and close it well enough that it heals and that, that makes the woman continent. We meet Dr. Hisa on one of his busiest days in a week that he has had fistula surgeries scheduled back to back. It is 3.30 p.m. in the evening and he still has an ongoing surgery, so we are permitted to quietly join him in this theater to watch him perform this life-changing procedure. What we find here can be likened to a battleground with an army of soldiers putting on a fierce fight to restore the dignity of women. It's not a battle for the faint-hearted and I had to keep my distance. It's bloody, sweaty, detailed and requires a great mastery of a team of skilled medical experts. I am inside the main theater at the Kenyatta National Hospital witnessing a fistula corrective surgery that is currently ongoing. We have been here for more than an hour. For many, this might appear like an ordinary surgery, but for patients who have battled with fistula in the society, this is actually what they need to get a new lease of life, to gain back their stolen dignity, to end the stigma, the shame, and the solitude of suffering from fistula. With the lack of information around the availability and success rate of fistula treatment, I wanted to find out how effective it is. And the surgery that we perform is mainly to restore the, the, the continence of either stool or urine for this woman. And with the hope that uh, it's going to restore her dignity. Dr. Hisa, however, acknowledges that the number of fistula patients who can access such treatment is still a drop in the ocean. On average, a uh, thousand new women developing with fistula in Kenya, and we are only able to help up to about 30% per year. It costs between 30,000 to 100,000 Kenyan shillings to get a skilled fistula corrective surgery, a cost many patients cannot afford. It's treatable, but people suffer even for 60 years, 50 worst, years a woman has been suffering from this the condition. The worst thing that can happen, women get mentally depressed. And, uh, and since they have no access to information that such a service is uh, available, they kind of seclude themselves quietly. In a bid to control the backlog of untreated fistula cases, the Kenyatta National Hospital has been running a program to offer free and sponsored corrective surgery to patients annually. But even that is not enough to meet the growing demand. We couldn't have gone nationally to mobilize women who have fistula to come forth mm -hmm. because of uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, this uh, would be a big crowd. Curious to understand the struggles fistula patients go through dealing with the condition and the experience in seeking treatment. I visit Dandora Estate in Nairobi. Here we meet Victoria Wanjiru, a survivor of rectovaginal fistula. She is 23 years old and says getting pregnant at 19 years made her go through the worst experience of her life. And before I knew it, kuna organs zilikuwa zinaanza kutoka nje. So, these organs zilikuwa the bladder, the uterus, and the cervix. 
So hapo na hapo nika I could not control my bowel movements nikapata incontinence of urine and stool and that was the beginning of everything As a first time mom young and inexperienced nursing such intimate physical wounds was just too much and the stigma was real Nili withdraw kabisa from from the crowd and on because unakaanga tu najiambia nanuka she knew she needed help urgently, but that too was not easy to find, prolonging her agony. Daktari kukuja satisa jioni, nurses wali ni examin na wakanieka ni akifika nione wa kwanza. Kufika tu hivi hata kutaka kuniangalia marambili. Hali niambia he cannot examine me. Na akasema next. It was until she visited the Kenyatta National Hospital that she was diagnosed with fistula. Her case was severe and she had to undergo a series of corrective surgeries to fix her complication. Surgeries, she says, put her at risk of losing her ability to ever have another child. Sani nilikuwa nasema anga kwangu lazima watoto watapatua na akotua all over the place. Alafu na yamia nimepata mtoto mmoja alafu na tika kutua uterus yangu. Ah nikamwambia daktari hapana yeye iwezekani kabisa. I'd rather ni kuwe na irudisha tu na mkono nitaishi hivyo. Akaniambia kuna an option lakini ni expensive. Akaniambia kuna mesh inaezaekwa huko nyuma kwa sacrum kwa mgongo is hold as is a mesh. Lakini hiyo mesh haiko Kenya. Lazima iimportiwe. So mimi nikamwambia daktari wacha tungangane na hiyo hata kama iko expensive hata kama hatujui do itatoka wapi. After spending several months in and out of hospital, she was finally reunited with her baby and began her long journey to recovery. Today we know about Victoria because she came out to speak about her condition and sought help, but according to Sharon Korir, a fistula advocate and founder of Save a Woman Fistula Foundation, there are thousands of fistula patients who continue to suffer in silence. The, the statistics range 30,000 to 300,000. Many women, yeah, who probably are leaking with no, with, with not nowhere to, to talk to, no, no hope, what to do, nothing. As a survivor of fistula, she knows too well where the shoe pinches. I'm a typical sanguine. I love people. I love to talk. I love to interact. But I, I was secluded. I didn't want anybody to visit my second baby. I didn't tell my sisters about it. I didn't tell my father about it because I didn't know how to start telling them I'm leaking urine and feces. It's very difficult to do, so, especially in this cultural setup. She decries the lack of information and misconceptions about the condition. It's a taboo. What did you do to somebody? You need to go back to the drawing board and ask your family members where in the lineage you went wrong so that we can appease, make peace with people because it's leaking stool from the vagina and urine is, is not normal. Sharon and Victoria may have been lucky to get their stolen dignity restored through corrective surgery, but the fate of thousands of fistula patients who have never heard of such treatments or cannot afford it is different. Medical cover does not cover child-related injuries, sadly, in this country. So back again to your pocket. So my question is, how many women are able to afford, right? How many women are able to afford to pay for themselves private doctors to do these surgeries? And then again, how many, how many Kenyans are able to be in Kenyatta Hospital? Every pain bats a story. Sharon Kurira set up an organization that amplifies the fistula agenda and offers refuge to fistula patients. So we're here to create awareness, fistula education and outreach, just to be able to, to, to let people know that it is there and it's treatable. And then again, after these women go through counseling, through you know, mental healing, we help them again after the surgeries and the mental healing to go back where? To go back to the, to the, the, you know, the respective homes to do what? to get reintegrated, to get acceptance without discrimination. Victoria, on the other hand, has joined in the fight against teenage pregnancy, a menace, she says, is common in the informal settlements, maintaining that no girl deserves to relieve her harrowing experience. It was positive young women voices, hapa penye tuko sahi in office yetu. So, hapo ndiyo na volunteer, tunasedia kumenta adolescent girls and young women, na tunawasedia in terms of reproduct sexual reproductive health we to come iso and as the world marks the international day to end obstetric fistula under the theme women's rights are human rights and fistula now 
addressing misinformation and bridging the gap of inequality of access to fistula treatment will remain pivotal if the global vision of ending fistula by 2030 is to be realized. And from that, just yesterday, we marked the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula, the 23rd of May. And here we are today having a conversation around fistula with the theme of four yesterday having been women's rights are human rights. Let us end fistula now. Now, without, you know, diluting that particular feature that was done by um, Safina Cheng, we want to dive straight into this conversation and helping us better understand from a medical standing what this this is all about in studio this morning we have with us dr dan okoro who is an obstetrician and gynecologist a reproductive health specialist good morning dr Ari. good morning jane thank you for being with us today to help us you know better understand when you talk about fistula what exactly we mean now um just looking at the international day to end uh, obstetric fistula for the benefit of our viewers who might not have understood what the day was really about maybe you could just shed light on what the day was about yesterday and the theme being women's rights or human rights uh and fistula now thank you jen and uh, it's a pleasure to to be joined the, the international community and even kenya pledge to have marked the international Day to End Obstetric Fistula. Mm. The International Day to End Obstetric Fistula was formed as one of the campaign advocacy programs to rally the community, the Ponyo leaders, mm. uh, the uh, uh, policy uh, formulators to, to drive this agenda of ending fistula. Mm -hmm. Fistula is a abnormal hole that joins between the urinary bladder, that's where urine leaking into the birth canal, mm -hmm. or from the can, uh, rectum, that's where the feces of the stool pass through into the, into the birth, uh, birth canal. Okay. So this is such a devastating uh, condition that women do suffer. Mm. Women who, go, who are expecting their babies and a bundle of joy, yeah. but end up with this kind of uh, bad outcome of having a leakage, a hole, or having incontinence, that means they just pass urine without any control. Mm -hmm. So International Day to End Obstetric Fistula, with that kind of theme of uh, women's rights are also human rights, mm. just to emphasize that women are being left behind. There's gender inequality, gender equities, the inequities that uh, frustrate the efforts of the women to deliver for this for this world. Absolutely. Yes. Now, bringing this conversation to the Kenyan space, and maybe yes. you could even help us paint a picture for us in terms of understanding the state of fistula in our country. Maybe you can even give us some st statistics as per um, the latest reports that were done when it comes to fistula. Uh, by and large, you must confess that we, the, the latest data that we have was done uh, by Kenya Demographic Health Survey, mm -hmm. which indicated 1% of the women in the reproductive age, that is 15 to 49. But by and large, it's quite difficult to quantify mm -hmm. the number of women who suffer fistula. Mm -hmm. It is estimated that about 1,000 cases, between 1,000 to 3,000, which is quite a huge number, yeah. occur each and every, every, every uh, that's every year to suffer from fistula. But however, there's a backlog of, of, of these cases worst being d given by the, uh, d when we have this pandemic which ma made it difficult even for the, the women situation. to access the services, yeah. one to get skilled birth attendants or to get into the internal clinic and even subsequently now to receive the treatment. So the numbers are quite huge. And uh, before even the COVID, out of even if I mentioned about between a thousand, uh, out of a thousand cases that do occur, mm -hmm. only between 600 to 700 women do receive care. So we, it, it means that every year we could have, add up four, up to about 400 waiting in the waiting list and more are yet to come. So okay. it is quite, because of the stigma associated, mm -hmm. not many women are even coming forth. Yeah. Some of them probably may not even know that's this treatment. Mm -hmm. this, they can be, it can be treated. They leave it. Uh, they are left behind. Think it's a, it's a curse, mm -hmm. and f many of many of them do not know that they, they, they can they where to get the treatment. Okay. Even the nearby probably facilities, 
may not we have the capacity to be treated to, to, to treatment. provide the treatment yes okay now you know um i was just going through an article yesterday and it termed um fistula as the single most dramatic aftermath of childbirth neglect and this brings me to maybe you can even help us understand when it comes to um this factors that may predispose or lead to fistula what are some of those causative factors that medically speaking have been known to have been the reasons that lead to fistula Yes, your reading is right uh, in the sense that uh, fistula should not be occurring in the current world that we are in. Mm. It is, uh, at least to say, is an ISO in a health system that um, it shows the breakdown of the health system. Fistula occurs because of an obstructed labor, mm -hmm. prolonged, obstructed, neglected labor. And many times women, as, as we say in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the medical field and the obstetric field, saying the three Ds, which normally cause even maternal deaths, mm -hmm. the deaths due, due to the complication of pregnancy. Yes. And we just say that one is that there's a delay even to make a decision to go to the facility mm -hmm. to seek treatment. Why? There may be reasons which you can be able to go through later on. Then subsequently, even when they make the decision to go to the facility, to the health, to seek health, the transport system, mm -hmm. how far do you go there? Is the facility open? Do they provide those services? Yes. Then the last delay is now, yes, you have arrived in the facility. The decision when to intervene. I've mentioned that the obstructed labor prolongs. We normally say that, um, that sun, the sun should not rise and set for the wom a woman who is in labor. Mm. But many times we talk about this prolonged, and some of them would work even at, especially those who labor much at home, they wait. There's a lot of waiting, and even the decision to be made, even at the facility, that now we need to refer this, this particular client mm -hmm. to seek treatment, even if it requires cesarean section to go to that particular place. Yes. Or even if you make that decision, the transport system. Mm -hmm. Even if it arrives there, maybe the, 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 the facility either could be, if it requires cesarean section, for example, mm -hmm. the theater may not be ready, unless yeah, it is, yeah. or it's, it is too full, there's a long waiting list of, of that. So that prolonged obstructed labor. But I must also be quick to say that while this obstructed labor mm -hmm. we could be the problem but some of the times we see even what we call iatrogenic that means either because of the during the surgery maybe probably it could be that cesarean section mm -hmm. or could be any other operation which is being done in the pelvic region for the woman mm -hmm. this inadvertently accidentally sometimes there could be a nick and those are the cases that we do occur right now we okay, see so many that times. is uh, cause number two cause number two number one obstructed obstructed labor, labor. and Come obstructed on. labor is anything that interferes the smooth progress of labor yes to the delivery. baby could be too big uh -huh. The baby could be lying abnormally mm, in the because bridge. yes, the bridge or even just transverse. Mm -hmm. the, the baby just abnormal lie that you can you cannot just descend down to the bath canal. Okay. Or yeah, the, the, those those could be some of the circumstances. Or labor may not even be, flow, be, be, be strong yeah. enough for to, to force the labor, and then somebody has not made a has not made a decision now that it needs to medical to, intervention. To intervention. All right. And then uh, the third one, which you see sometimes also, is the cancer or cancer itself or treatment of the cancer, the mm -hmm. cervical cancer, for example, during the radiotherapy. Or even so, so eating out into that mm. the, 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 the barrier between the birth canal and the bladder, or even uh, the, so the, the rectum yeah. and, the, and, and the birth canal. Okay. Yes, and other cases also do occur. Unfortunately, maybe some other trauma, even including sexual violence. Mm. Yes. So this, these are some of the co these are the common cases that do occur. Okay, and maybe to just add to some of those causes, and you can help us better understand medically speaking, for those who may be having bowel disease, are they also at risk of uh, developing fistula at one point or the other, or there isn't any relation, medically speaking? Medically speaking, most of the bowel diseases do not lead to, unless this probably a particular infection like tuberculosis, mm -hmm. maybe something like that, or could be having a disease we require other treatment methods, which either be the surgic, surgeon, surgical uh, intervention, like mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier on, yes. so in the process of treatment, or could be required, it could require radiotherapy, and, as I've mentioned earlier on. Okay. But ordinarily, it should, there isn't the connection. Mass, yeah, maybe, it's, yeah, maybe, no, not okay. commonly not. All right. Now, another factor that I did found to be. Um, sort of holding water and maybe you could just help us clear is we in as much as we're living in the 21st century we still have some cultures and uh, part of our ethnic groups that still practice fgm has this in any way medically speaking been linked to uh, be a causative agent to fistula 
There, there is what you call a secondary link of the FGM. Okay. Unless an obvious trauma that's during the time of the procedure. But one, thing, one way in which FGM could be linked in, is this, that FGM, most of the time, the culture which practice FGM, the, the, those girls, the, they call the children, actually, mm -hmm. because they are, they are beyond 18, yes. they end up being married off. Being married at an early age is a link which is one of the, uh, is one of the causes, because of teen, teenage pregnancy or a young girl, the, the, the pelvic region is not well formed. The bones oh, are not yeah, well formed. The pregnancy, the babies be, mm -hmm. cannot be able to pass. So this baby body is not well prepared for the pregnancy. So FGM itself linked to child marriage, the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, pregnancy in a child, and therefore getting obstructed, the risk of obstructed labor. Mm -hmm. And that in, that in that way, it's directly linked. Directly linked, yeah. yeah, and it's it's very sad that this is still something that is happening. And that is why and we, age. as even as UNFP, the United Nations Population Fund, we we champion against the fistula in those two fronts. One, mm -hmm. access to the quality care for the for the uh, that the pregnancy will be wanted at a, at a good sign. Yes, and the quality care during the pregnancy and childbirth, and also against the child marriage and harmful practices because Absolutely. in looking at the transformative uh, results that we, wa we we are championing one of which is ending harmful practices including child marriage and FGM. Yes. Absolutely. It boils down to sustainable ways of keeping these interventions in place. Yes. All right. True. Now, for those who might not really understand or could have been in a position where they maybe would have been affected by fistula, but they didn't know it was actually fistula, how does it present itself? How does it manifest itself? Those signs and symptoms that could be uh, pointing to fistula that one might not be really aware of. So two things that uh, have been as mentioned earlier on that um, of, of this obstructed labor or whatever it is that has caused an abnormal hole communicating between the, like now, the urinary bladder, mm -hmm. where the urine, the, the, the bag that holds urine. So there will be leakage of urine. Mm -hmm. You will not control. You just find, the, the lady finds herself just wet, pouring, wetting herself, whether seated, seated, standing, or, or it could be you, uh, the stool, the fecal matter passing through, mm -hmm. we, we're just finding in the birth canal in an abnormal area. So this, this, and sometimes it it could be both. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that it could be both, and most of the time it could occur as after the after the, the delivery itself, that prolonged dis or difficult labor, mm -hmm. or after the surgery, or whatever it is that's a condition which predisposed to this. Yes. Yes. Now let's just look at some of those challenges that are there that could have maybe um, been a hindrance of sorts when it comes to controlling fistula in this day and time, and especially in our country. And just looking at the stats, is that there are at least 3,000 new cases every year. And just from that feature that was done by Safina Cheng, you can clearly see that medically speaking, we also have a long way to go. But let's just start with the question of poverty. Um, in what way, from your interaction with the people, from the research that you have done, and as a representative of UNFPA, how has poverty contributed to a hindrance when it comes to the fight against fistula? Unfortunately, fistula affects majorly the vulnerable, impoverished women and girls. Mm -hmm. So poverty, one, uh, especially looking at the women or the girls, these are the, the girls who will not go to school. So school helps keep the girls in, uh, to, to delay even marriage. Mm. So we'll also be practicing this, some of the especially cultures where, where, where FGM is being practiced and they end up with child marriage. Yes. Poverty will not we, makes them even when they get married, they cannot make a decision all by themselves. They are not empowered to make a decision when to get pregnant, how, uh, when to get skilled care to the facility, go, go to the facility. Mm -hmm. Do not, and we not even, even if when they make a decision that now, as a family, to go to the facility, they may not be able to pay for those to, to transport. While we appreciate the government efforts of uh, providing the free maternity care under the Linda Mama, in the, especially in the public health facilities, mm -hmm. but there's an issue of the moving movement from here to the to the facility, from where they're staying to the facility. So poverty leads in, uh, contributes heavily on on that. Mm -hmm. And even when they make the when eventually for those who get a treat, who get who get who suffer, unfortunately suffer the the fistula. 
how to make the decision now to get to treatment. And they resolve to probe the cultural practices. Those are the ones who may end up even thinking that this, mm. whatever condition I have is a curse. Yes, it could be some way, maybe witchcraft or mm. whatever it is that had happened in the family lineage or somebody, something happened. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they do not seek care at the proper time. Now, that brings us to the aspect of awareness yes. from both the medics and spilling down to the general population. How are we faring? When large people may be aware of, of the fistula, but not to a great extent. But I would be more, it would be more important, one, for people to be aware that they can be able to prevent it. Okay? So be, people will be able to aware that they, they, they can seek care during the pregnancy, okay. during the, child, the time of childbirth, and even subsequently. So awareness is improving. We thank God for the, the media, like now Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, like you and other, many, many, many others. And we're also using other, with UNFP together, through the government and even other partners coming on board, mm -hmm. working with the community health volunteers and other champions. And we thank uh, High Excellency, the First Lady, uh, for doing, for championing uh, the, through, through the Beyond Zero Medical Zero Safaris yeah. and that campaign that she's doing, that making people aware of uh, cases and supporting the treatment of, of, of women living with fistula. All right. Yes. Now, that brings me to the next aspect um, that is still linked to poverty, and that now comes to the cost of treatment when it comes to fistula. Please um, give us the, fig the figures if you have them, and you know, just looking at how practical it is, considering is it a price that cuts across that a, ma a majority of the people can afford, or it's also one of the hindering factors that needs to be looked at by the government, the Ministry of Health, and all stakeholders that could have a say in it. The cost of treatment of fistula is quite high. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, okay, it can range depending on the facility that one goes to, uh, but for, at a public health facility and the lower, when they, when they can be able to, 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 to support that treatment, because the experts are also not many mm. for that matter. So sometimes even if you, if you want to go to a facility, even a level four, level five, they may not be able to have it's the physical expert. Yeah. So the cost can range anywhere between 30,000, depending on what facility. And this is also including in terms of the, of, of, uh, of, uh, the human resource, mm -hmm. up to even over 200,000 if you go to the private facility. But when you're doing a, a, a little analysis recently, we found 60,000 shillings on the supplies only. The medicines and the supplies that are required have not put in the cost of the doctors, the nurses, mm -hmm. and the, the physiotherapists, every other team that is involved. So when you look at that cost, it's quite expensive. And that's why even in the private sector where each and every item is costed, mm -hmm. you find it goes to even 200,000. And this is unaffordable for the poor woman that I've mentioned earlier on. Can you imagine? So, that cost is good. And we thank the government of Kenya for having the Minister of, through the Minister of Health that has incorporated physical care treatment within the NHIF, mm -hmm. National Hosp Hospital Insurance Fund, yeah. which has taken care of this in, in some way. But the challenge sometimes is some of these women also may not be able to afford even being on board in the NHIF. Mm. And uh, this, so it boils down into enrolling them into NHIF and having them access the treatment where that is possible. But otherwise, generally, it's an expensive uh, affair for the women because in any case, even during a few, assuming that some of the women could, be, could have been doing their own small businesses or uh, whatever business, having the fistula will not make them, will not enable them now to sell mm -hmm. because of the smell, the stigma associated, they will now be get more impoverished. Okay. Yeah. Now that brings me to the next aspect and now medically speaking is now on the part of the professionals that are available to actually do the procedure. Um, from your understanding and from where you stand, why is it that we don't have enough specialists to be dealing with, or rather to um, be the ones to be able to help us bring down the number of cases of fistula that we are seeing in our country? 
There may be many factors, multiple factors associated with led this because first training initially was not quite an easy. It's not was not many experts were available to to train even those who would have been willing to. Yes. So I remember some of, some years back we could send uh, surgeons uh, to those who desire to get treatment outside the country. They were going to Ethiopia, Nigeria. Or even other, kind of, yeah, or whatever else. So they were not able to get the treatment, uh, uh, to get the skills. Yes. But luckily enough, we are, have now the experts. So one way is, um, I must also just be honest, say that sometimes it may not be rewarding financially because these are poor women. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, it's only just recently when NHIF came into this. So this would not be, you will not be kind of so much in terms of financial reward. So maybe the motivation to get into this. Mm -hmm. But generally it's the treatment there of, um, that it may not be quite easy to get this, this, uh, the skills, the skilled training that was there before. Okay. But we are lucky that uh, we have the Kenyatta National Hospital, the Gyno Care, which are currently acting as training centers mm -hmm. for the fistula for those who desire to, to, to be trained as fistula surgeons. Okay. But nevertheless, they are not as many even still. As we would yes. need as in the country. Them. Yeah. Yes. No. And uh, sometimes also the frustration that comes in in the setup of the equipment that mm. are required. So you may be trained, but if you are posted to a place, maybe a level, another level four facility, you may not have the na required uh, equipment mm -hmm. the, or the facilities that help you. So those skills probably die off. Okay. Yeah. But okay, from a, as a medic, what does this even say about our healthcare system? You know, um, health in itself is a devolved unit, meaning that both the national and the county government have a huge role to play when it comes to the quality and efficiency of the medical sector, of the health sector. What does this say by virtue of having some of these gaps you know, ranging from equipment which in that in turn leads to you know the lack of personnel to actually do these uh, procedures which now boils down to now if a patient comes to a hospital there isn't a professional to do this and that because there aren't equipments to be able to do this procedure what does the, this say about our healthcare system yes uh, Jen thanks a lot and uh, just said it right and um, the challenge now we have, or let me put it this way, we have managed through various initiatives as, as, a, as a, the, the country will, has made it possible for many women to, increase, to access the facilities to deliver and be using now uh, pregnancy here. Yes. And uh, we used to have probably 46% or 44% in the somewhere in the early 2000 mm. then we moved to 62 percent in 2014 right now we are moving we are probably 78 percent of the women out of 100 with 78 or 70 or 78 percent are give birth, give birth mm. in a health mm. facility and that is the progress challenge which is for. progress which yeah. is good we have managed to pull them yeah now the challenge is mm -hmm. now providing that quality of care mm -hmm. it ranges from what you say some of the factors that we have mentioned human resource the numbers are far too low they and then the skills the knowledge attitudes then the equipment and the supplies which needs now to bring to be brought on board so that to make it the healthcare services uh, of good quality that will save the lives mm -hmm. because we've managed to to improve on in terms of those uh, aspects but many women are still dying mm -hmm. out f from from the uh, because of the poor quality of care. Absolutely. So we need the midwives, we need the doctors uh, to, to provide quality care. We need the supplies and all those equipment to help them work. Now, there is um, a drive that is currently ongoing and a call out for women who have, you know, uh, been affected by fistula, of course, uh, in partnership with Safaricom Foundation, the Flying Doctor Society of Kenya, and of course, UNFPA. For the benefit of our viewers and those who might not really know what it's about and why um, we're even here having this conversation, what do they need to know about this campaign and drive that is going on at the moment? Uh, Jen, what has happened is that um, we've, we're rallying behind these organizations that we've mentioned, UNFPA, AMREF, Flying Doctor Society, Safaricom Foundation, and Kenyatta National Hospital support the Beyond Zero. Mm -hmm. COVID came last year, 
And fortunately enough, by that time, we had only done one camp uh, led by Her Excellency at Mama Lucy Hospital and in January, February thereabout, yes. then in March. So there has been a lag, a, a lag in terms of women accessing treatment. As a result the, of a ripple effect of COVID. COVID. Oh, so now, coming together, mm -hmm. so we're trying to, we understanding that the challenges are there we avoid the congestion we avoid the facilities recently we find we were with the ministry giving us uh, feedback that the facilities are congested mm. so we could not even people could not even just um, access the the fistula would, would be one of those things that will not um, attend to immediately so we attend the emergency of the covid which is understandable, oxygen, we need oxygen first. Yes. So the beds, most of the beds and most of the theaters could have been occupied for one reason or the other, uh, but the facilities were congested. Yes. So taking this in consideration, we are trying to mobilize a few and working innovatively, trying to make, uh, put, a, uh, put up a campaign to support the women who may be suffering from fistula right now. Mm -hmm. It could be silently going, we're not going to outward to mobilize as many, but we just to show that it is still possible, yes. even at the county level, to organize for, a, for, 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 a, for the women to receive treatment in, in, in those conditions. All right. Yes. So when they are looking for this treatment, are there those um, check-off points that they need to uh, satisfy in order to receive treatment or what how is that um being rolled out in terms of receiving treatment like now for ex what we're doing right now is that most of the patients have been seen earlier on mm -hmm. when being screened so then uh, someone could have been screened at the nearby facility could, could be coming as far as Kilifi. yes could be coming as far as uh, maybe some, some somewhere in the western part, part of the country is and or even just eastern around so they go to the nearby facility mm -hmm. and have been screened and they've been waiting maybe more than six months more than two, close to 12 months just waiting to for that time to be treated to, to receive the treatment yes. so they screened and then they are referred mm -hmm. so we don't we don't have this mass screening that we used to have previously because of the covid mm -hmm. uh, be, uh, at kenyatta national Hospital that maybe many could come so similarly even at the facilities outside in uh, kenyatta it is still possible, so like Kisi, which, which, which Kisi Teaching and Referral Hospital, mm -hmm. Kisumu, uh, Gaino Care Center, even M um, Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital. Some of those facilities have fistula surgeons okay. who, can, who can provide the treatment. Okay. So it's an initiative to just show that it is still possible. We have COVID, yes, but co fistula condition can sure. still be managed within within that condition absolutely yes and for those who are seeking treatment are there different kinds of treatment that are offered or um surgery is the main form of treatment in this particular case it depends on the type of the fistula that and how large it is and all. some of them will just go on with physiotherapy only they just need to be because it's just incontinence due to maybe laxity of the muscles uh, probably because of that prolonged labor i must say that sometimes some of those people patients who suffer uh, who go through prolonged labor or mm -hmm. obstructed labor even end up with paralysis which wear off and, and and so sometimes even the nerve or the muscles get weaker so physiotherapy alone will just be enough so they're being taught how to do this process okay yeah so they may not necessarily have to have surgery but the majority of them who come are, are, who require surgery, surgery yes. All but right. some of them do not even require surgery, as I mentioned. All right. Yeah. So the current campaign that is ongoing is for those who had already um, been screened and are just awaiting treatment. Awaiting treatment, yes. And if you haven't been screened, you can go to the nearby facility and get uh, be screened first in yeah. order to know which form of treatment you need. Yes, true. That's that. Then, then you'll be told. And also, they, uh, they will also be having some of the places will uh, will may end up calling. Mm -hmm. While this this camp that we are having at Kenyatta National Hospital ends on 28th, mm -hmm. that does not mean that treatment ends. Yes. So it will go beyond that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Remember, just yesterday we marked the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula, with the theme being Women's Rights Are Human Rights, and fistula now we are living in a time where you know most of the african and asian countries are the ones that are heavily affected by fistula you know looking at some of the countries in the west they eradicated fistula mm -hmm. decades ago so why is it that we are still dealing with fistula um 
3,000 cases on a yearly basis. That is a huge number. That is a huge number that we cannot be dealing with. And uh, just looking at the stat is that up to 6% of maternal and neonatal death can be linked to uh, fistula. So we, we need to do better. And just looking at this drive, you can be able to assist in one way or the other, even if it comes to the dissemination of this information to those who might be needing it, and yet they do not know. Only 7.5% get treatment out of this 3,000 figure that we are hearing on a yearly basis. So go out to the social media, get to understand the campaign and be part of the course of ending fistula here in our country. And, you know, due to the constant of time, we'll have to pause this conversation at this point, but that does not mean that this conversation ends here. Do what you can where you are with what you have to end this tragic, tragic um, case that we have to deal with as a population when it comes to it being as a result of childbirth. We have been speaking with Dr. Dan Okoro, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist, as well as a reproductive health specialist working with UNFPA. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, for more of this information, you can also check the social media to just know what is happening, and especially in regards to the drive and the campaign at the Kenyatta National Hospital. With that, we want to wish you a lovely day on behalf of the Good Morning Kenya crew. Um, do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Have a lovely day. Be sure to join us again tomorrow morning right here for another edition of Good Morning Kenya. My name is Jade, uh, my name is Jade Wamboy. Have a lovely day. See you tomorrow.